part nine. This is it. This is the last episode. So the last uh, part eight was about an hour, a little hour and 15, 10, 15, 20 minutes, something long, something like that. This one's short. This is it. This is the last um, part in the episode or in the in the general license class, last episode in the general license class to get your general upgrade from technician. So special thanks to the Hearst Amateur Radio Club, W5HRC. You can catch their website, W5HRC.org. And special thanks to Mike, N5YM, who um, presented during the entire class. He's the one you hear talking throughout all these videos. So I very much enjoyed recording this. I hope you get some use out of it. Please share it with any anyone you have, anyone you know wanting to upgrade. Put your comments below and uh, check out the video. Shut up and sit down. Okay. Go by getting your signal from your radio to your antenna. We'd call, we do that, we call it feed line. There's a lot of names for feed line. The names are kind of descriptive of the shape and the size of, and the configuration of the feed line. Um, there are several types. There's coaxial cable, is one of them we talked about. Coaxial cable has two conductors. It has a conductor in the middle, has an insulator around the outside of that conductor, and it has a shield around the outside of that, then it's another, you got another conductor, and that shield's usually ground, a ground potential. And the stuff in the middle is called a dielectric. There's also twin lead. Twin lead has two leads separated by air, or something in the middle called a dielectric. This is called window line, or sometimes ladder line, because it looks like a ladder, or window line, because it has insulating material here to hold the, the two pieces of wire, the two conductors, the copper conductors, at a constant distance apart, and has openings in it to conserve weight. Some of the really inexpensive stuff that they used to use on televisions had a solid piece all the way down through there. That was called twin lead. It had two leads on either side. I have some here. I have coax. I have two different sizes of coax, and I have some 300 ohm twin lead. Coax typically is going to be either 50 ohms characteristic impedance or 75 ohms characteristic impedance, 72 to 75 ohms characteristic impedance, depending on the type. Your twin lead usually is going to be three or 400 ohms, and that depends upon the size of the, of the conductor the distance in between the conductor and any kind of insulating material in between that. That's determined by that. Okay so far? RG59 is a small piece of cable. It's just under a quarter of an inch. RG6 is just over a quarter of an inch. RG6 quad shield is a little over a quarter of an inch. RG11 is just under a half inch. And Heliax, which is an air insulated, really low loss cable. It's a little bit over an inch. If you're going to run really long distances, you want to use Heliax. It's expensive. The impedance, the size of the conductor, the distance between the conductors, here to here, there to there, or here to the shield there, determines, and the type of insulating material in here, determines the impedance of it. This is called the dielectric, that insulating material. You're going to see coax typically in 50 ohms or 75 ohms. There are other ohm impedance coax cables. You are not going to find those readily, and we don't typically use them. On coax, let me back up just a little bit. On coax cable, bigger is better. Remember, bigger being better. We'll show you why in a little bit. Here's different types of coax. We talked about decibels, and this is loss. There's no free launch. There's resistance in that coax cable. The fact that there's two conductors spaced apart, there's some capacitance in there, there's some inductance in that, just the fact that it's a wire, there's some inductance in there. There's a lot of factors, but the size of the coax cable, its composition, and the frequency determines how much loss there's going to be in that cable, how much your, of your signal that you're going to lose in that cable to heating and other, and other things. 
and the loss is expressed in decibels. So it depends on the size of the construction. Loss increases as frequency increases. The loss on a, on a table like this is measured in decibels per 100 feet, and the general rule is bigger is better. Let's take a look at this. This is a cable loss dB per 100 feet. I look at RG174. Some of you may have seen this. If you've got one of those little antennas to put on your cop of your car, it's got a little gumdrop mount on the bottom. It's got a really thin piece of coax on it. That's a high loss coax. Now, you don't care too much as long as you only use that to go between your radio or your HT and that antenna on the top of the car is not too bad. At 1 megahertz, the loss on that is 1.9 dB. At 10 megahertz, the loss is 3.3 dB. Remember, 3 dB is about twice as much. So you're going to lose half your power on 10 megahertz with 100 feet of this coax. 100 megahertz, 8.9 dB. Now you're up over 10 dB at 200 megahertz. At 400 megahertz, where the 70 centimeter band is, you're up to 17.3 dB loss on that cable. You want, if you're going to use it, you want to use short lengths of that. Now that's for 100 feet. If you're only using a 10 foot piece, it's only going to be a tenth of that. It's going to be 0.19 or 0.17. So as far as getting snaking it around your window, yeah, you don't want a big piece of half an inch in diameter trying to go around your, your door or window. So this is not bad for that. RG58 is a larger cable. Bigger is better. At 1 megahertz, it's only 0.4 decibel. At 400 megahertz, it's only 11 decibel. RG8 is a low loss version of RG58. It's only 7.9 decibel and only a half a decibel or 100 meters. So you see how as the frequency goes up, the, 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 the uh, loss goes up per 100 feet and the as the quality of the coax improves, the loss goes down per 100 feet. So it's dependent upon frequency. 9914 and 9913, if you're going to do 100 megahertz and you're going to put an antenna out in your yard, this is the kind of stuff you want to use. And this guy's less than three, for 100 feet, less than 3 dB loss. Let's take a look at this. We'll use an example. 100 foot length of RG11, it's a 75 ohm coax. I have a 1 dB loss at, on 6 meters and 50 megahertz. That's approximately 20% of your signal is going to be lost in the cable. Okay? So you want to select your coax. If you've got a long, if you've got a 50 foot, you want to put an antenna up above your house, 50 foot high, or 50 foot long to get up to your antenna. You put an antenna up your house, you want to come back inside the house, and you want to use 50 feet of antenna. Okay? You're going to take, this is per 100 feet, you're going to take that 50 foot, divide it by two. And let's, we'll kind of, on two meters, which is somewhere around here, what coax do you want to use? Well, if you use 9914 or 9913, you're about 1.5 dB loss. It's about, not quite, you know, 3 dB is going to be twice as much loss. So you're, say, 3 quarters of time as much loss, or 1 and a quarter as much loss. Or let's go someplace we got 3 dB. Let's look here at 400 megahertz. 99.14, you got 2.9, which puts around the 3 dB loss. So are you going to lose half your signal in your coax on the 70 centimeter band at 400 with 50 feet of R99.14? What are you going to do about that? Well, what I prefer to do is put an antenna up that has at least 3 dB gain. If I put an antenna up, it's got at least 3 dB gain. I add those two together. I add minus, th minus 3 dB and plus 3 dB, and I break even. If I get an antenna up, it's got 5 dB gain. Now I'm coming out 2 dB ahead. My effective radiated power is greater than what I put in. So this is how DB, what, what the advantage of dB, you don't have to do ratio to ratio to ratio to ratio and build a complex formula to figure that out. You can just add or subtract dB. 200 feet is going to be twice as much. Does that make sense? This is how you pick your, when you're going to pick your coax. Yeah, you can live with 15 feet or 10 feet. 
here. If you're going to use that mobile, that really thin stuff, so it gets out you know, on your mag mount antenna, so it can, you can snake it out the window or snake it out the door frame. And you're going to talk about, at 10, at 10 feet, you only have a tenth of that, so you're going to have 0.17. You're going to have, a, 0.17 is, probably, is going to be negligible. Well, I should move it one decimal place, 1.7. That's still going to be negligible, yeah. antenna with the, I think it was 174 uh, wire. Now, when does it become better just to keep the, the stock antenna on a handheld than to use that just with, I guess, a certain length um, where you just have way too much loss? Or how much loss would it Well, one of the things you want to think about, and we'll go back to technician again, if I'm going mobile, I want my antenna outside the car. Mm -hmm. I don't want it inside the car. Okay, one of the reasons I don't want to inside the car is I'm surrounded by metal. I'm inside of essentially a Faraday cage. I've got a lot of loss, and I've got passivated glass in my windows. Okay, I've got a lot of loss. So if I have a handheld antenna inside my car, I've got a lot of loss. I want to put that antenna on top of the car, get out of the car, so I don't have as much loss. That's when that antenna makes sense. That makes sense. And with regards to this, this is not a unity gain antenna. This is short. This is less, on two meters, this is less than 19 inches long, so it's a compromised antenna. I've got loss in this antenna alone because of radiation efficiency in this short antenna here. If I'm inside of my house and I can take one of those mobile antennas, a mag mount antenna, and I can stick it on top of my refrigerator and it's 19 inches long, I want to use that. Yeah. This is handy for carrying it around. Anytime I can hook this onto a better antenna, I'm going to do better. I'm, more, I'm going to receive better. I'm going to transmit better. I'm going to affect, use my antenna a lot more effective. As long as I can put a better antenna on this, I'm going to be better off. This is good on my belt. If I get a 19-inch antenna, that gets a lot better. With the longer one, like the Nagoya 771, I think it is, it's a better antenna than this one. But this one's nice because it fits on my belt and doesn't put me in the armpit. So a compromised antenna, it's, it's the best I can do without hurting myself. Yeah. But why do, they, why do they make some antennas that, you know, they use the suction cups up to the windshield? I've never bought one of those kind because I thought, it's kind of defeating the purpose. <coughs> I mean, that's just like a roadblock. Yeah, well, it does get it away from the metal. It gets it's as best you can do to almost get it outside the car. Um, the, like I said, most, most glasses now, I have these, I have these um, solar glasses that turn dark and outside, they don't turn dark in, in the car in the shade because of the passivation on the glass that blocks the UV rays. That passivation is metallic as well. So um, it's probably better with that suction cup on the windshield than it is sitting between the seats, but not much. So if you put an antenna on your roof, it's not on a pole, but it's just up on the roof. Mm -hmm. No, or, or you're talking about a mobile antenna? Or no, I'm talking about just a house antenna that doesn't require nope. a ground Because how, how would you ground the antenna? The you've already got it grounded. You've already got it grounded right here on the shield. First, you've got to ground the shield. I'm going to suggest that you put it up there, you put it on a metallic mast, on a metal mast. Don't, if you're going to put it on, on a tower, the tower is going to be metal. The tower goes into the ground. And you'll put ground, you always want to ground your tower. But not on the tower. Oh. How would you ground the antenna? I would, I would just use the shield. So, I mean, how does that help you on lightning or anything else? Well, you, what you want to do is you want to put a lightning arrestor, or you want to ground your coax before it comes in the house. Not if you've got one floating by itself up in the air, no. If you, if you stick it physically on the roof, yeah. If you put it on a mast on the roof, my antenna mast on the roof has a, has a, ground, rock, a ground wire that goes from my metal antenna mast on my roof, on my, it's on my chimney. It goes from my metal chimney and it goes to a ground stake on the edge of the roof as close as I can get to it. So I've got the mast grounded. But if you have it on an insulated mast, then you're just gonna have to rely on your shield. Those vent pipes for, I don't know, like sewage or whatever it goes to, those are usually grounded too, right? 
if they're not, they're typically PVC. Well, the top part, the, the, the top part, oh, you may have, the, the top part is, is, is actually lead. It's a piece of lead where you can fill that in the top. But mine is all, um, the stuff that goes up from mine is PVC. I've got PVC every place in my house except my sewer drains, and that's cast iron. They don't help me at all. Yeah, I think that's probably what it might be is CY. No. Just an old antenna I had up there, but it never did work either. <laughs> Common coaxial cable connector types, and we've seen some on that path thing I passed around. The SMA, um, SMA, probably most people have, unless they have an old handy talkie or an old scanner, has an SMA connector on it. The pin, whether is that the pin, the center pin determines whether it's a male or female connector. So my radio has a female SMA, and my this antenna has a male SMA connector on it. The, the, they're good from DC to about 1.8 gigahertz. Nice, nice, um, connect, nice connector. I don't know how much power I'd want to run through those, but they're a good connector uh, for two meters and <coughs> 70 centimeters. A good all around high power connector is the N connector. It's good from DC to 10 gigahertz you probably won't be operating over 10 gigahertz. The BNC connector has been around for a long time. It's good from DC to four gigahertz. It's a pretty good antenna. It's a, it's a, it's a high frequency antenna. This antenna here, a PL259, was commonly referred to as a UHF connector. It goes good from DC to 150 megahertz. I don't know why we want to call it UHF. UHF don't start to 300, remember? But it's known as a UHF connector. Don't worry, the back of your radio, if you have a dual band mobile radio, is going to, have a, going to use this connector. It'll work. It's just not the best choice, but it's the typical choice. We talked about matching. We talked about impedance to the antenna. Your radio likes to see 50 ohms. Your radio is set up on the antenna for 50 ohm impedance. It likes to see a feed line of 50 ohms and an antenna of 50 ohms. Remember we said maximum power transfer formation, maximum power transfer happens when the source impedance equals the load impedance. And the source, so here's the source, and this is the antenna system, that's the load. Now I've got maximum power out because I have the source matched to the load. Back up. Okay. Source matched to the load. 50 ohm antenna, 50 ohm coax. Best I can do, only thing I'm losing is loss here and whatever loss I have in my length of feed line. And if I got a gain antenna, I'm making up for it here on the end with a gain antenna. So hopefully I'm going to come out pretty much even or better. Now what happens, I'm pushing the wrong button, that's why. What happens if I got an ant antenna here that's 200 ohms? I got a 50 ohm coax and I got 200 ohms. Well, now I've got a mismatch. I'm not getting maximum power transfer. For, as a matter of fact, I'm getting reflective. Some of that power is reflected back. It's converted into heat. Okay. That's reflected power with a mismatched antenna. So I'm getting reflected power back, so I don't want to get reflected power. I've got to do something to fix that. I, I realize I can recognize that reflected power coming back by finding a high SWR, a high standing wave ratio. And the standing wave ratio is a ratio of power going out to power coming back. So I'm going to notice that on a high, with a high SWR reading. Standing ratio, light ratio. It's a ratio of forward power compared to reflected, reflected power in the antenna system. So I got to fix that. My radio doesn't like that. The 200 ohm, my radio, most radios have a protection circuit. They don't like power coming back into them when they're transmitting. And because it'll tend to overheat the finals and burn the radio up, the final amplifier uh, transistors. So most radios will either reduce the power automatically or shut themselves down if the reflected power coming back is too high. 
I had a, a pickup truck with a, a six meter antenna on, I damaged the antenna. The reason I found out I damaged the antenna every time I put, pushed the push to talk button, my radio would shut off. Something wrong here. Why is my radio shut down? Well, I went back and looked and the antenna had been damaged and uh, had who knows what impedance on the other end. But my radio protected itself by shutting down. So starting radio growth can be easily calculated. Whatever the largest impedance divided by whatever the smallest impedance is to one, relative to one. So if my antenna is 25 ohms and my coax is 50 ohms, I got 50 ohms to 25 ohms, which is two. My SWR is two to one. The lower the impedance, one to one is ideal. If you remember right, one to one is the ideal. As it goes up, you're starting to lose power. You're starting to have mismatch problems. Um, so on top of your antenna loss that you normally have for your coax, now you're heating up the coax as well, and you're losing power due to heat in the coax. It may not shut my radio down, but it's definitely going to reduce the radiated power of the antenna. 200 ohm antenna, 50 ohm coax, 200 ohms divided by 50 ohms, the larger by the far is 4 to 1. SWR is 4 to 1. Most antennas, most radios will shut down above 2 to 1 automatically. What I wanted, I can tell that by looking at my SWR meter. The SWR meter displays a ratio between the forward and reflected power. You put it between the transmitter and the antenna. That tells you how good it is. A lot of radios have SWR meters built into them now. That multifunction meter we talked about earlier in the first class, the multifunction meter, you can set, on a lot of radios, you can set the multifunction meter on your radio and say, show me SWR. And when you press the button, it'll show you what your SWR is of your antenna system. How, how, uh, there's another way to measure it, not only with, with, a, um, with a transmitting into it. I transmit into my antenna and I read my SWR. And if I want to read a different frequency, I change the transmitter and I transmit my antenna and I, and I read the SWR. I'm putting a signal out in the air. If you do that, make sure you identify. You're required to identify. There's another way of doing it called an antenna analyzer. An antenna analyzer is a standalone device. It allows you to test the antenna without using a transmitter. It does transmit a very, very, very low, low amplitude <coughs> signal. And what you can do on the SWR meter is you can adjust it back and forth. You can map your antenna. You can say at 148, what, about, what am I reading? At 144, what am I reading? You can sit there. You can play with the antenna. It's great for making adjustments to your antenna or to your feed line. You can measure SWR, you can measure impedance, you can measure a lot of nice stuff with the, with the uh, uh, antenna analyzer. The one thing you have to be careful of, it's sensitive to strong signal overload. Um, I had a guy that, that had a problem, and he, he uh, had a repeater site, and that repeater site was shared by about 15 other commercial radios, antennas on that repeater site. He was talking about adjusting the antenna. So use an SW, uh, a antenna analyzer, I can't use an antenna analyzer. He said, some of those stations are putting out two and three kilowatts. He said, my antenna analyzer can't handle that kind of signal coming in. It's not meant for received signal. It's meant to analyze its own transmitted signal. So that's the only downside is there's sensitive strong signal overload. And odds are good you're not going to have that on your antenna if you want to measure the one at your house or want to measure the one in your car or whatever. It's a great way to tell how, how to adjust your antenna length. That's how I adjusted the length of this antenna here. Remember I told you I tuned it to the sweet spot? I put it in my car, I hooked the coax up the way I was going to hook it up. I tie wrapped it together so I knew that I could duplicate it. It would always be the, the coax and everything would always be in the same spot. And I adjusted this length here, this antenna, up and down till I got the lowest SWR in the spot in the band I wanted. But I never transmitted it on my radio. It was great. I could just stand, sit there in the car and reach out and move it. Adjust the set screw, move it again until I got what I wanted. And when I put it back on, I was done it a couple of weeks before my trip. When I put it back on before my trip, I checked it once again to make sure it was everything was the same. They're great. If you don't have one, borrow one. A lot of hams have one. So if you're going to put an antenna in your car, put an antenna in your house, come to one of the meetings, come to one of the Saturday sessions here, 
Let us know what you want to do. We'll bring an antenna analyzer and we'll check the antenna system out for you. Now, what do you do in your house? What if you got an antenna here that's 200 ohms and your transmitter wants 50 ohms on this one here? I just has a very narrow bandwidth on the same band, narrow, narrow bandwidth at the sweet spot. When I go up frequency from that sweet spot, my SWR goes up. The impedance changes. The SWR goes up. When I go down from that frequency from that sweet spot, the SWR goes up again. I've got this dip here, this little narrow dip that my radio sees 50 ohms. If I want to get outside that band now, all of a sudden my SWR gets up pretty high. My SWR will get up higher than what my radio can handle. I've got to have some device to trick my radio into the, into seeing an antenna system to make the system look like 50 ohms. I've got to have some way of transforming my 200 ohms here to 50 ohms here. I do that with a thing called an antenna ant tuner or transmatch. This is, an, this is a manual version of one. This allows me to select with this thing here, an induction, a different inductance value, multiple inductance values. This allows me to put some capacitance on the input on the transmitter side and some capacitance on the, on the um, antenna side. And I can adjust these until I get my transmitter seeing 50 ohms, even though my antenna sees 200. That's called an antenna tuner. That takes care of being, that matches an antenna matching network. That matches an antenna uh, ohm, uh, impedance to my radio. It doesn't change the feed line. It doesn't change the antenna. It changes the impedance here that my radio sees so I can operate in that. Do I get a free launch out of that? Nope. I lose power in this thing. But it doesn't shut my radio off. It doesn't damage my radio. So it allows me to use a non-resonant antenna and trick my radio into thinking I'm seeing a resonant antenna. Call an antenna tuner. You can do manual ones like that. The one I had that I was running mobile in my, my mobile radio, my go kit, is an automatic antenna tuner. It has a, a microprocessor in it. It reads the SWR, it has a bunch of, re of capacitors and a bunch of inductors inside of it. It has relays to switch them all in and out in different combinations. And when I press my mic button, it goes, oh, um, it's not 50 ohms. It automatically starts making a bunch of changes, and within a second or so, it selects a, a, set, a pair of capacitance values and inductance values that makes it look like 50 ohms here again. Pretty cool. Automatic antenna tuner. Or a manual antenna tuner. A lot of times a manual antenna tuner will tune stuff that an automatic tuner just can't tune. There's a limit to what it can, an automatic antenna tuner can tune, and sometimes you can tune with a manual tuner stuff that they can't tune. There's a thing that used to happen once a year called the Strange Antenna Challenge. It was a get-together on weekends, kind of a net where people got together, semi-contest, and the rule was you couldn't use a regular antenna. You couldn't use an antenna made out of tubing or, any, or wire. You had to use something strange. And guys loaded up bridges. They loaded up canoes, crutches. They loaded up all sorts of stuff. And they transmitted. And they talked to one another. Called strange antenna channels. They all use manual antenna tuners. RF safety. You probably heard this in technician. We're going to hear it again for general. Radio frequency, RF energy is radiation. It's non-ionizing radiation, which means it does not alter cells or cause tissue heating. Well, uh, alter cells. It does cause tissue heating, like a microwave. When you put something in a microwave and you heat it up, you radiate it with RF energy, and it causes the molecules in there to start Moving around, excites the molecules. If it's meat and stuff like that, of course, you put your hamburger in it, it causes the meat to heat. But it's non-ionizing. It doesn't change 
the, the, the structure like ionizing radiation does. The human body absorbs RF radiation at different amounts at different frequencies. Some frequencies don't bother you at all. Other frequencies, your body is, is very uh, receptive to that. It causes tissue heating. Most susceptible range is 30 megahertz and up. 30 to 300 megahertz, VHF band. <coughs> it depends on the frequency and the strength of RF radiation and how long you're exposed to it. So how strong it is, what frequency it is, and how long your exposure is determines how much radiation you get. Microwave is an example. We'll talk about duty cycle. Microwave ra uh, oven relies on duty cycle. If your microwave oven is running on high power, it's running on 100% duty cycle. And you can tell because you can hear that thing run 100 for 100% of the time. And you get the maximum heat out of that. It heats what's in that oven the maximum amount of time. However, if you put it on 50% duty cycle, set it on 5 instead of 10, it turns itself off and on and off and on and off and on. You can hear that. You hear it run for 10 seconds and turn itself off for 10 seconds and run for 10 seconds. It only heats half as much as 100% duty cycle. The same thing applies to ham radio. The evaluations that are made with, when we talk about evaluating the, the tables that you use for evaluation are based on 100% duty cycle. If you only operate your radio half the, time, half the time you're transmitting and half the time you're receiving, you're only using a half, a 50 percent of the duty cycle. So you factor that in when you're taking uh, your measurements, when you're evaluating. And you're required to know the RF radiation levels emitted by your equipment for your safety of your household. That's called a controlled environment. You're required to evaluate how it's going to affect you and your family. People, and they're, they're, it's expected in the controlled environment that everybody knows when the radio is transmitting, whenever, when someone's using a radio. The controlled environment is a local environment in which everyone in that environment has the has capability of knowing that you're transmitting at that point in time. That's a controlled environment. Uncontrolled environment is your neighbors, the people walking up and down the street. Uncontrolled environment. You're, you're required to evaluate that as well for maximum permissible exposure. The uncontrolled environment is all those people who have no clue that they're walking by your house that you're transmitting 100 watts or 1,500 watts. That's the uncontrolled environment. You can perform RF exposure evaluation using any of the following methods. Direct measurement by a calibrated instrument. Direct measurement, go outside with your calibrated high dollar field strength meter and measure, or wherever you're sitting at, or wherever people are at, measure how much radiation they're getting. You can use mathematic calculations based on the OET, the Office of Engineering and Technology Bulletin number 65, or computer modeling cal calculations. This is the one you probably want to use. This is a nice table, but this is the one you probably want to use because you really don't have to do any interpolation in that. You go in online, there's a number of online applications, it'll ask you, what frequency are you operating at? And what kind of antenna do you have? Because different antennas have different gain. If you're operating a dipole, if you're operating a, a uh, gain antenna, Yagi antenna, remember Yagi has forward gain. The assumption is it's pointing at you or pointing at somebody. Okay, so they use the highest gain that's normal for a Yagi antenna and the frequencies you're operating on. <coughs> and then it'll tell you, based on what the maximum exposure is, how far away you have to be. You put in that information, you say, you're safe at 50 megahertz, you're safe at 3.5 feet with a vertical antenna. You go, well, my vertical antenna is 35 feet in the air. I'm okay. So you can, by, by putting that information, it'll do those calculations for you. And that's 100% duty cycle. If you're operating a 50% duty cycle, which would be surprised if you are, a 50% duty cycle is half as much. 25% duty cycle is a quarter as much. You are required to do that if you have 50 watts or greater in that magic band we talked about. Factors are the effect of resulting power is the frequency and power level of the, RF an, of the RF field, the antenna height and distance from that to a person, that's any person, 
and radiation pattern of the antenna. Electrical safety. We'll talk about a little about electrical safety. People who want to be self-sufficient are probably going to use a generator. Some of the things we need to recognize when we use a generator is don't fill it up while it's running. Shut it off before you fill it up. The last thing you want to do is be pouring gas and spill gasoline on a hot engine. And then have it flare up and you have to be standing there with a gas can in your hand pouring out gasoline. Use it in a well ventilated area. Never use it inside an occupied area. Don't run a generator in your house. Don't run a generator in the garage with the garage door closed. Um, make sure you've got a well ventilated area. Carbon dioxide will wipe you out. And don't ever connect it to your house wiring unless you have a professionally installed disconnect. Don't think, well, I got this generator here and my power's gone out and they tell me that since the tornado came through like the people in Dallas, I may not have power for three days. So I'm gonna take my generator and to keep my refrigerator running, I'm gonna put a plug on both ends of my generator and I'm gonna plug it right into the wall and power my house up. That sounds good, except you just powered the entire system up. So when that poor guy comes and climbs up the pole and goes to hook your electricity back up, he's got his end shut off. He thinks it's dead. And then you're about to go, when he reaches up there, you're gonna electrocute the poor service guy and just trying to hook your, your thing back up. And also, if it's powers out down, the power, the trees down, down the, knock the power line down the street, you're not gonna power your house up, you're powering your neighbor's house up too because they're on the same circuit. So you never want to just plug it into your wall. If you want to power your house with a generator, have a disconnect installed professionally that allows you to disconnect your house from the rest of the power system before you put your generator on. And if you can do it, if you run that generator outside, put an earth ground on that generator. The fuses, always use fuses. For your station for equipment and other appliances, use a fuse size recommended by the manufacturer. They know what's right. For other circuits, fuse or breaker size should be appropriate to the wiring being used. A good rule of thumb on 20 gauge wire, or 12 gauge wire, don't use over a 20 amp fuse. 14 gauge wire, don't use more than the 15 amp fuse. Never put a fuse on that white line. Always fuse the black colored wire. Don't fuse the ground, the neutral, the white, and don't fuse the ground for crying out loud. Our bare wires. Only put your fuse in the black wire and the positive side of the circuit. <laughs> and NEC rules apply to electrical safety for your shack. I'm not sure they're ever going to come and inspect you, but they imply, yep. Yeah, you could, well, on DC, you can fuse both sides of DC. It's not, a, it's not a problem with DC because you're not going to be running anything over 12 volts in your DC. But, but you don't need to, right? No, you don't need, you don't, really only need to, to fuse one side. Uh, a lot of your radios are going to have a fuse in both sides. Um, there's a feeling that if, if you use it mo your radio mobile and you put it in your car and you're, you have a short and the system fuse in your system trips, it'll try to power your radio through the, ne the neutral side of it, through the ground side of it. Um, that's possible to happen, but I, 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 and it's theoretically possible to happen. I've never heard anybody have that problem. Everybody talks about it like it's happened to, to everybody, but I've never heard anybody it actually happened to. The ratings are different. The fuses are rated. Uh, you'll look on the end of the fuse, it'll tell you what it's rated for. The, fuse, the fuses are rated for AC or DC. No. Ground fault circuit in interrupter, GFCI. These are nice to have. They disconnect the 120 or 200 volt IC line. When a current flowing from one or more of the voltage carrying lines flows directly to ground, which means if you touch one side and then touch ground, if you 
drop your hair dryer in the sink and pick it up, um, it's going to kick off. It senses a current as small as four or five milliamps and can react as quickly as one thirtieth of a second. And if you don't have proper ground in your house, if you got you put before you put a, a, a GFCI, I would recommend that you get one of those little devices you plug in to see that the ground side is connected to ground, the hot side is connected to hot, and the neutral side is connected to neutral, and somebody didn't scramble the wiring in your house. Um, it makes them work a lot better. If you scramble the wiring in your house, you're probably going to find those things going to be tripping all the time. Review. Antenna feed lines. There's a couple of kinds of feed lines. We'll talk about coax cable. They come in 50 and 75 ohms. It's the most common. The PL-239 connector is used up to 150 megahertz. That's a spec up to 150 megahertz. You'll find it's used up to, to uh, 70 centimeters up to the UHF band quite frequently without any noticeable, um, any noticeable problems. The only problem you're going to see is a small impedance change right there to connector. It does say 239. What's it? Uh, 259, I know what that is. What's a 239? 259 is the, uh, the female side. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Attenuation increases as frequency increases. The higher the frequency, the more loss the coax cable has for attenuation. It's measured in decibels per 100 feet. In a chart, you'll see in decibels per 100 feet. It's always for, for your purposes. Always know how long your coax is and modify that accordingly, proportionally. Parallel conducted feed line, 400 ohm, 50 ohm window line is most common. Ladder line, it's also called ladder line a lot because it looks like a ladder. Uh, that's typically what's used for most amateur radio um, applications for antennas when they use a, a parallel conductor line. Impedance is controlled by the conductor size and the distance between the two conductors. Standing radio wire show, the SWR, that's the ratio of forward power compared to the reflected power in the antenna system. One to one is ideal. You can, you can determine the SWR by taking the, one, the highest impedance divided by the lowest impedance and relating that to one. <coughs> it includes the antenna, feed line, and any other devices in the system. So when you're measuring SWR, if you want to measure the SWR for the antenna, you should do that right at the antenna feed point. It may not be practical if it's 70 feet in the air, but you should measure it. But still, you need to, effectively, you really want to measure the system, which is right as it comes out of the back of the radio. That's where you want to measure it. Then you get the impedance of the antenna and the feed line, because your feed line, depending on its, its characteristic impedance, affects the SWR. You can measure it with a directional watt meter or an SWR meter. It's calculated by the largest impedance by the smallest impedance. RF energy, non-ionizing. It causes tissue heating in the body. It's um, predominantly will affect your eyes before it will affect more than anything else. It's predominantly, your eyes are the most sensitive. Make sure your station is safe for you and for others, and those others being the people in your house, and the people walking up and down the street, the people in your neighborhood. When ex estimating the maximum permissible power exposure, you consider duty cycle, which is averaged over time, you consider the power density, and you consider the frequency. The power density is like antenna gain figures into that. We're at the end of session three. It's over. Hey, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to comment below any suggestions or what you liked about the video or anything like that. I'm excited to be part of a new project that uh, was rolled out by YouTube called Viewer Applause. So if you're watching this video right next to the like thumbs up button, there'll be an applaud button. You can click on that. It'll donate $2, a one-time $2 donation to that specific video. And that'll tell me which videos are more valuable to the audience, to you as the audience, than other videos. And it also helped me grow and monetize this channel into 2020 and well beyond. 73, and thanks for watching.